Welcome back to Bad Things in History, where our only agenda is that talking about history is worth doing. Our exploration of the worst and mostly forgotten events of the 1980s continues. This time we focus on the chaos of 1981. Assassination attempts, murder, and preventable accidents were just a few of the problems people faced in this dangerous year. Let's begin with the story of a nightclub fire in Ireland. Stardust Fire The building that would one day become a nightclub was constructed in 1948. For 30 years it contained a food factory, but in 1978 the structure was modified to hold several new businesses. One of those was the Stardust Nightclub. The Stardust was designed to hold 280 people, but on the morning of February 14, 1981, at least 841 people were in the building. They were there for a Valentine's Day disco event. At 1.30 a.m., as the party was reaching its climax, a disaster was brewing in the next room. A barrel of cooking oil was stored there. An electrical fault produced a spark which caused it to catch on fire. About 15 minutes later, patrons on the dance floor saw smoke. They could also smell that something was burning. Then the fire came through the roof and engulfed the tables and chairs. The partygoers began trying to escape the building, but the routes were blocked. They tried using emergency exit doors. They were locked and wouldn't open. The windows had bars on them which couldn't be removed. People ran for the main entrance and started trampling each other to death. Firefighters started rescuing the victims that could be reached. Despite their best efforts, the fire claimed the lives of 48 people. It injured 214 more. An official investigation claimed that arson was to blame. This angered the families of victims who thought it was an accident, but the ruling allowed the owners of the Stardust nightclub to receive compensation from the city of Dublin. In July 1985, an Irish folk singer, Christy Moore, released a song called They Never Came Home about the fire victims. It claimed the reason people died was due to the blocked exits. Irish courts found that Christy Moore had committed libel with his song and ruled that he was in contempt of court. Killing a Prison Guard Sometimes serial killers who go to prison don't stop murdering. Lemuel Smith was born in Amsterdam, New York on July 23, 1941. He grew up in a very religious household, but the teachings of Jesus didn't suppress his urge to kill. Lemuel strangled a young girl to death when he was 16. The district attorney made a mistake while handling the case, meaning Lemuel kept his freedom. And he kept killing, too. He moved to Baltimore, Maryland to continue his crime spree. On April 12, 1959, he kidnapped a woman and beat her nearly to death. He was captured and sent to prison again. Lemuel was released in 1968 and began living near Albany, New York, but on May 20, 1969, he kidnapped two women and assaulted them. He was arrested again and sent back to prison, but he was released once more in October 1976. For the next year, Lemuel enjoyed a murderous crime spree. He kidnapped and killed at least six women before finally being arrested. After pleading guilty, he returned to prison on February 2, 1979. Lemuel was sentenced to spend the rest of his life behind bars this time, but it wouldn't be enough to suppress his murderous urges. Donna Pant was born in New York on March 22, 1950. She graduated from the Correction Officers Academy in 1981. Her father had worked as a corrections officer for nearly 30 years, so it made sense for Donna to follow in his footsteps. She was employed less than a month before being murdered. On May 15, 1981, Donna was assigned to Lemuel's cell block. A prisoner posed as an employee and lured Donna into the chaplain's office. Lemuel was waiting there, and when Donna arrived, he strangled her to death. Then he wrapped her body in plastic and tossed it into a dumpster. He was convicted of killing Donna and was sentenced to death on June 10, 1983. However, in 1984, the state of New York decided the death penalty would no longer be allowed. His sentence was commuted to life in prison. Lemuel Smith is still alive and in prison today. Attacking the Queen Queen Elizabeth II was not safe from the anger of her subjects in 1981. Marcus Sargent was born in Dover, England in 1963. 
1978, he joined the Air Training Corps, a volunteer British military organization. He earned a marksman badge while serving, and it looked like Marcus would have a career in the military, but his dreams would not be realized. He tried to join the Royal Marines, but left after three months, claiming he was bullied. He then tried to join the police, but was rejected. Next, Marcus worked at a zoo for a short time, but couldn't keep that job either. Despite starting various careers, most of the time, Marcus was unemployed. In October 1980, he joined the anti-royalist movement. Marcus opposed the monarchy and thought the queen needed to lose her job, and he was willing to threaten her life to make it happen. He wanted to buy a weapon, but had problems acquiring one. Eventually, he was able to get a starter pistol and blanks. Although it couldn't kill, Marcus planned to use the gun anyway. Every year, there is a ceremony in London called Trooping the Color. The military performs in a parade that members of the royal family usually attend. On June 18, 1981, Queen Elizabeth participated in the parade. Marcus Sargent was in the crowd waiting for her. As the Queen rode by on her horse, he fired six rounds from the pistol. Her horse was momentarily startled, but she quickly brought it under control. In the meantime, Marcus was arrested. While being questioned, Marcus said that recent assassinations inspired him. In 1980, John Lennon was shot, and earlier in 1981, assassins tried to kill Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul II, although they survived the attempts. In each of these instances, the killers became famous. And Marcus wanted to be celebrated too. Before going to the parade, he told his friends, I'm going to stun and mystify the world. I will become the most famous teenager in the world. He was sentenced to prison for five years, but in October 1984, Marcus was released. After gaining freedom, he changed his name and started a new life. Hyatt Regency Collapse In the 1970s, the United States economy was under severe stress. Inflation was out of control and unemployment was high, so when expensive building projects appeared, there was a lot of competition among the contractors bidding for the jobs. This competitive environment also encouraged them to use the cheapest materials possible and it would have deadly consequences. In May 1978, construction began on the Hyatt Regency Hotel in Kansas City, Missouri. But the process didn't proceed smoothly. There were numerous delays which caused the project to fall behind schedule. At one point, the roof of the building collapsed. Workers had to fix the damage and start over. Despite these difficulties, the hotel opened on July 1st, 1980. The finished building was 40 stories tall. Its most impressive feature was a series of walkways that connected several floors. The walkways were made of glass, concrete, and steel. Each one weighed at least 64,000 pounds. On July 17, 1981, the Hyatt Regency was hosting a dance event. There were 1,600 people in the main lobby that evening. The walkways above them contained around 60 spectators. At 7.05 p.m., guests in the lobby heard a loud crack. Then two of the walkways above collapsed and fell on top of them. The hotel guests were trapped under thousands of pounds of steel and concrete. The fire department tried to rescue the trapped patrons, but they didn't have anything capable of moving the heavy debris. Volunteers started arriving from all over the city with industrial equipment capable of lifting parts of the building. The rescue attempt lasted for 14 hours. In the end, 114 people were killed. Another 216 were seriously injured. An investigation found that the original design for the walkways didn't use steel rods that were strong enough to support their weight. During construction, more changes were made to the design to reduce costs. The new materials were even weaker than those in the original design. More than 300 lawsuits were filed. A total of $3 billion was paid out in settlements, which would be worth roughly $8.94 billion today. The hotel reopened three months after the collapse. Whiskey on the Rocks Starting in 1949, the Soviet Union began building whiskey-class submarines. They were diesel-powered submersibles, mostly used for patrolling coastal areas, but throughout the 1960s, the submarines received several upgrades, including nuclear missiles. Karlskrona is a city in Sweden that also contains the country's largest naval base. In October 1981, the Swedish Navy was participating in training exercises. Their war games were interrupted by a real enemy. 
The Whiskey-class submarine known as S-363 was watching the Swedish Navy but drifted too close to the action. The submarine struck a rock 10 miles offshore and was forced to the surface. The Swedish Navy sent an unarmed officer onto the submarine to meet with the Soviet captain. The captain said his navigation equipment was damaged and the event was just an accident. The captain was taken off the submarine for more questioning. Meanwhile, the Swedish Navy discovered that the craft contained nuclear weapons. Later that day, radar detected several ships entering Swedish territory. It was assumed that Soviet warships were coming to retrieve the submarine and the Swedish Navy prepared for war. However, it turned out the culprits were two German merchant ships. On November 5th, Sweden's government decided that the best thing to do was return the Soviet submarine. They used tugboats to take it back to international waters where it was handed over to the Soviet fleet. The Swedish investigation concluded that the submarine entered its territory illegally and on purpose. The United States encouraged Sweden to deploy weapons to destroy any invading submarines in the future. This event became known as Whiskey on the Rocks. Kidnapping a General even United States military officers were victims of crime in the 1980s. James L. Dozier was born in Arcadia, Florida on April 10, 1931. He graduated from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point in 1956. He served in Vietnam and also worked in the Pentagon. By the 1980s, James had achieved the rank of Brigadier General. On December 17, 1981, he was a Deputy Chief of Staff for NATO, and his office was in Verona, Italy. Unfortunately, an Italian Marxist guerrilla group called the Italian Red Brigades wanted to use James Dozier to achieve their political goals. And as James returned home from work, they kidnapped him. Four men held James and his wife at gunpoint. His wife was left chained in the laundry room, but James was taken to an apartment and held a prisoner. He spent his time in captivity chained to a cot beneath a tent. James had a light bulb above him that was never turned off, and he was forced to wear headphones that constantly played loud music. The kidnappers confused authorities because they never made any specific demands. Instead, the Italian Red Brigades kept releasing statements complaining about NATO and the United States, but they never mentioned any conditions for releasing James. On January 28, 1982, 42 days after he was captured, Italian police successfully rescued James Dozier. They figured out where he was being held, stormed the apartment, and captured the kidnappers. The Italian police did this without firing a single shot. James retired from the military in 1985. For many people in 1981, violence was just a way of life. When combined with negligence and deadly accidents, death was all too common. What do you think about this strange year in human history? Did we miss anything important? If so, then tell us about it in the comments below. If you liked this episode, then be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next entry in the series, and hit the like button if you want to help us out. Your positive feedback makes us happy, and also helps the channel grow. Thank you for watching Bad Things in History.